So good afternoon. Welcome to all of you uh, on behalf of Elisa team, on behalf of Francesco Pignatelli, uh, Elisa action leader and senior program manager on behalf of uh, Lorena Hernandez, uh, responsible for knowledge transfer under the Elisa activity and the project officer and myself, consultant. Uh, all of us at the working for the Joint Research Center of the European Commission. So to, today uh, we will be hosting the webinar uh, with the, the title Immersive Realities and Location for Better Public Services. Before uh, jumping to the topic of the webinar, maybe a few words about ELISA. Uh, as you can see on the next slide, so ELISA stands for European Location Interoperability Solutions for e-Government. And it's a part of the ISA Square program, a European interoperability program aiming actually to provide cross-border and cross-sector interoperability solutions for public administrations, businesses, and citizens. There are more than 50 different actions among uh, under the umbrella of this ISA Square program, uh, tackling interoperability from different angles, different corners. And the ELISA action is the only one actually uh, focusing on the location dimension. Um, as you can see further, uh, ELISA aims uh, to break down barriers and promote a coherent and consistent approach to sharing and reuse of location data across sectors and borders uh, in the context of the digital transformation. And this is done by achieving different uh, aims or objectives. So to, by supporting different policy initiatives uh, on European and national level, uh, by uh, providing reusable, interoperable cross-border and cross-sector frameworks and solutions for public administrations, businesses and citizens, by discovering emerging trends and technologies and uh, how they enable more effective use of location data for policy and digital public services. And last but not least, for building geo-knowledge base uh, with the aim to inform and train stakeholders and promote the adoption of good practices and innovation in location data. So within the, uh, this ELISA knowledge transfer activities that was mentioned last, uh, uh, we are organizing uh, periodically webinars uh, to engage in agile way with topics of relevance to the digital transformation and uh, the, to, to, showcase, to showcasing and promoting the consolidated results of ELISA action activities. Uh, as you can see on the, on the next slide, so today, um, actually, the, the, as, as I mentioned already in the beginning, we have this, uh, the, the, the webinar with the title Immersive Realities and Location for Better Public Services. As uh, already mentioned in the announcement of the webinars over the past years, uh, uh, many of new uh, visualization techniques have emerged, for example, virtual reality, which is used, which uh, used in different kinds of simulators, augmented reality emerged uh, as a technique uh, to combine pictures and videos, in particular with the development of different devices. So all these techniques are combined and applied in different sectors, uh, such as spatial, spatial planning, military, tourism, cultural heritage, to, uh, undergrad assets, and so on. So there is a huge potential actually to integrate those techniques in location and uh, enable public services. So this webinar today will provide you with some examples and uh, uh, try to explain uh, a few of them and looks also into the key interoperability challenges and ongoing efforts. So that will be done by our speakers, Danny van der Brucke, who is a senior researcher at the KU Leuven University, and the guest speaker, Vicente Bayari from uh, Gym Geometics. So at this point, I would uh, ask uh, Danny to take over and maybe explain what uh, we will cover today. I hope you can hear me. Okay. And you should see my screen. Uh, before uh, explaining the agenda, maybe we can start, uh, Simon, with the first two polls to know uh, our audience better and uh, to set the scene. Uh, can you take over with the first poll? Yes, of course, Dennis. I'm launching the first poll, so about your affiliation. So I kindly ask to uh, answer the question. So about your affiliation, so whether you're coming from public administration on EU level, national, local level, are you from the academia, private sector, consultant, non-governmental organization, private individual? If we 
didn't cover everything and you are maybe other, please <laughs> give us an uh, explanation in the chat box. So maybe we have another five, 10 seconds. About 75% of you voted. Okay, so let's let's close it here and share the results. So as you can see, most of you are coming from the National Public Administration, then the European Public Administration is quite well represented. Uh, okay, so uh, as uh, uh, Danny mentioned, uh, we will have uh, uh, two polls at the beginning. So the next one uh, would be about uh, uh, your knowledge and expertise in the field of immersive visualization techniques like uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed realities. So have you ever heard about them before this webinar? You have very superficial knowledge about that, you work with them maybe, or you consider yourself as an expert in the domain of immersive visualization. So we have some experts. Perfect. Maybe another five seconds. Okay, let's close the polling, and sharing the results. So the knowledge, so you've heard about the immersive realities, but you have a very superficial knowledge, more or less. So uh, Danny, I think you have enough inputs to start with the, with the webinar, please. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Simon. And very interesting results there. Uh, so what we will try to cover today, uh, we had already the introduction. First, we will look a little bit into the different terminologies and uh, technologies used, virtual, augmented, mixed, extended realities. What are they very briefly? Uh, in the third section, we will look at what could immersive visualization do for public services. And in the fourth uh, part, we will dive a little bit deeper in two particular uh, examples, one on virtual reality for cultural heritage and the other augmented reality for underground management. Uh, and we will finish with, uh, as we do always in the Elise seminars, looking to particular interoperability efforts and challenges. And then of course, we finish with uh, takeaway messages, conclusions and uh, questions and answers. Uh, okay, uh, let's start with uh, the first uh, part. First, maybe a few key messages before uh, I go to this first uh, or the second section. Um, key messages we want to provide in this webinar is that uh, such immersive visualizations, they exist already for some time. Uh, first was emerging uh, virtual reality, then came after augmented reality. Now we see more and more mixed reality. And we see in all these developments that the location component is always, or in many cases it's there, not only, but uh, in many applications implementations. Uh, second key message is uh, of course that all these uh, immersive visualization technologies are based on technological developments, both at the hardware side, but also data related developments are very important without which it's very difficult to, to do these developments. And the third message we want to provide is that there is a rising number of applications we see, uh, including in the public sector. Uh, and we see that there are a lot of opportunities there in many uh, public sector uh, areas. Uh, we can name a long list and we see we will see different examples, but you can think about security, about health, tourism, transport, spatial planning, emergency, education, et cetera, et cetera. And in some cases they are really already operational, but also in other cases, it's more uh, kind of piloting or uh, experiments that are ongoing. Uh, okay, let's uh, have a look at uh, what these uh, different realities are about. Uh, I will not discuss very broadly all the definitions because you can also provide many definitions, but briefly, what is virtual reality, what's augmented reality, mixed reality, I will come back to that. Uh, first of all, virtual reality is clearly a computer generated simulation of a setting. It's artificial, usually three-dimensional, um, and it's using, in many cases, particular devices, 
going from a very specific de devices. Uh, let's think about flight simulators uh, in the uh, aeronautic industry, but it can be also gloves, it can be screens, it can be special goggles. Uh, and usually they have very specific sensors. So the sensor uh, development is playing a big role there. Um, and uh, what is important in virtual reality, it's uh, providing a realistic feeling experience for the user. Uh, besides the uh, aeronautic industry, we can think about uh, application in, in, in entertainment, commercial, for example, uh, seeing your new house or your new kitchen in virtual reality. The military have developed a lot in this field, etc. Uh, so besides virtual reality, you have the, uh, what you heard about, I guess, is augmented reality. Um, there it's more interaction, more interactive experience where you have a combination of a real world environments through, for example, a camera, through a smartphone, a tablet, whatever, uh, where you see in video mode your surroundings, your environment, but where you enrich it, you enhance it with computer generated and perceptual information. Uh, and sometimes you have quite complex settings uh, with multiple sensors, uh, modalities, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, but let's say the, the big difference is that you have here um, what we call augmentation of reality. But the, the link to reality is key here. Uh, if we uh, look at um, the development of both virtual and augmented reality, uh, they, in fact, are uh, uh, emerging almost at the same time, uh, uh, around the end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s. So it was coined in the, in, for virtual reality uh, by Jaron Lanier, in the case of augmented reality by Tom Codell, uh, both are around the same time. You can even see that augmented reality as a, as a term was first mentioned already in papers in 1950. This is the result from Scopus because you can have other or different ways of uh, finding back all the publications about it. But what you can clearly see is the number of publications is much more for virtual reality as compared to augmented reality. Uh, surprisingly, last year, 2020 saw a, a slight decrease in virtual reality publications, but you can also see that they have a kind of similar um, publication track uh, a little bit earlier for virtual reality as well uh, with different uh, uh, tops or pikes in, in, in the graph, while uh, in, in reality, augmented reality is a little bit more recent, let's say. Um, it doesn't stop with these uh, two realities. Uh, more and more, we see the emerging of mixed reality. Uh, where uh, we have a blend of physical and digital worlds uh, along a kind of a continuum uh, where, uh, of course, computer vision, graphical processing, display, but also input uh, through sensors and others uh, to enrich the reality, to make the reality more real, uh, more sophisticated. Uh, and where before you had mainly interaction between humans and computers in different ways through the mouse, through whatever device, you have now more the environment, which is a, usually a physical, a real environment, but not only physical, where this environment is also directly influencing. There is, of course, interaction between human and environment, but there is also interaction nowadays between the environment and the computer. Uh, and that can be many things that can be elements related to location, but also object recognition, sound, lighting, and, and so forth. So uh, it's becoming more and more complex. Uh, and we see that also in the next slide, which is an older uh, figure, but in my opinion is a good summary and I will not discuss it in detail, uh, where you see that mixed realities along this continuum and link between the real environment and the virtual environment where augmented and augmented virtuality and augmented reality is somewhere along these lines but where you have with new techniques with new hardware with new uh, data uh, flows and streams uh, uh, more uh, mixed situations and more complex setups 
so I leave this uh, figure also for your convenience in, in the slide deck because you really can see also all the references to uh, very interesting literature, but we don't have the time in the context of this webinar to discuss this all in uh, detail. Um, nowadays, also, you will hear about the term extended reality. Um, it's more an umbrella uh, term that is, is used to, in fact, cover all the different types of realities, uh, because there is the assumption that the technology will evolve further and that you will see emerging new uh, technologies, new realities. So the extended reality is to cover this whole world, this whole ecosystem. And you can see in the left figure also that uh, depending on the technology or the different types of realities, you also use different type of devices, uh, more and less sophisticated. So there are uh, many different uh, flavors there. And with that, uh, I will stop with two uh, uh, slides on this first section, uh, is that, of course, these uh, different immersive visualization techniques would not be possible on the one hand without certain hardware developments. Uh, of course, the computers themselves with more powerful computer graphics. Uh, in the background plays also the developments and the experience on the gaming consoles that par is partially integrated in these, in these new devices. You have, of course, also the mobile devices. Uh, augmented reality would be very hard without smartphones development, etc. Also sensors everywhere, they are everywhere now, uh, they play a role. You have particular devices like holographic immersive devices, while holographic devices uh, allows looking through objects. This is not the case in, in, in the case of immersive devices where you really have a virtual setting uh, and that's why, uh, why you are using this uh, virtual immersive devices. Uh, but also you have all the developments related to eyewear, different types in which, in fact, there is a connection of computer sensors uh, to connect to uh, certain platforms and to ask for certain information. So hardware has played an important and still plays an important role uh, in all the developments. But there are also the so-called soft developments, uh, because if we speak about virtual reality, we speak in fact about simulation of a reality of, of something that is maybe not real. So we speak about modeling, simulation, prediction, and the developments there. We also speak about what is happening or happened and still happens in the gaming industry, the 3D aspects and also the time aspects, but also in the context of urban uh, uh, settings, the uh, BIM developments are, are connected to all, the, all what we see. Uh, there is the development of digital twins. So you will see one example where uh, the example of the implementation of the virtual reality is relying on digital twins, for example. You see more and more the integration of applications, uh, but you see also more and more dynamic and complex data flows and big data, big data streams coming from sensors, but not only. Uh, so it's both developments in the hard part and in the soft part uh, that allows uh, and makes uh, these new technologies possible. And therefore, in this uh, second uh, section, we will look into um, immersive visualization for public services. What could it mean? Is it happening there already? Uh, and yes, we, we should uh, be confirmative there. Uh, we see in a lot of, and oh yeah, I almost forgot we will have, at the beginning of this section, uh, uh, a question of Paul again. Uh, yeah, please, Simon. We don't hear you. Sorry, yes, having heard so far, uh, so the basics about the immersive uh, realities, maybe you have uh, already some ideas in which field of public services do you think those uh, techniques are most pro promising or practical? So please, uh, uh, healthcare, education, spatial planning, tourism, cultural heritage, military, environmental monitoring, transport, mobility, or any other. If you have any other suggestions, ideas, please put them in the in the chat box. And uh, I'm encouraging you to answer. Yes, seventy percent, seventy-five. Let's maybe 
leave for another five seconds and then we'll stop with the polling. Okay, thank you very much. So sharing the results, spatial planning is the first one. Tourism, cultural heritage, education, healthcare. Okay, Danny, please. Yeah, I'm not so surprised for, uh, of the answers on spatial planning because uh, uh, I remember that virtual reality was already applied with very complex settings uh, already 15, 20 years ago. So I think that's one of the areas where you indeed can uh, see these technologies being applied and further developed. Um, I go to the next slide. Yeah, uh, we'll give a few examples and uh, please, uh, after the webinar, you are invited to uh, go to uh, the different uh, URLs or the different websites that are mentioned in the slides. Uh, this is a, an example of city tourism uh, to promote Hel Helsinki as, as a city. Uh, uh, maybe surprisingly to maybe uh, in the future have less visitors physically, but more visit, uh, visitors uh, virtually. Um, so virtual Helsinki uh, is, is based on a digital twin of Helsinki, which are quite, is quite far developed, uh, which is a, a digital twin focusing more on the city center, uh, based of course on 3D and which is a virtual reality implementation. Uh, both combining indoor outdoor um, so the outdoor uh, part is uh, focusing more on the city center with the central square but also some of the islands uh, around uh, Helsinki while uh, the indoor is more focusing on a uh, cultural heritage site of one of the famous um, uh, writers of, of Finland. Um, what is interactive here, what is uh, possible here is to do and to have viewing from different angles, but also the virtual reality um, um, application is showing Helsinki through four seasons. So you see the, the city and the same, the same square, the same island, etc. Uh, at different moments of, of time, so covering different seasons. So the idea behind is this having this virtual tourism uh, in Helsinki, they even target, uh, I have no confirmation that they reached the target, but that to have uh, 1 million additional virtual tourists. Uh, and they uh, explicitly uh, motivate this also with having uh, and supporting the sustainability goals. But they have also in mind, and that would be interesting to know more about because we have no time in the context of this webinar, how they intend also to use uh, the digital twin and the virtual reality technologies for spatial planning again, because that's on their board uh, for shopping. So virtual shopping and then uh, ordering online, getting uh, the, the products you, you choose, uh, but also to have citizen involvement at the level of city policy. Uh, so this is a, an interesting uh, example in, in, the, in the field of tourism. It's operational. So if you go to the website, you can uh, play uh, and visit, in fact, uh, the city uh, briefly. I think there is even there at the level of city tourism even more possible in the sense that uh, if they enrich also that part on, on tourism, uh, you would even really be able to choose your own uh, locations or your own areas, your own visits. Uh, that's not yet uh, possible for the time being. Uh, another example, another public service is in the, in the context of healthcare and health policy. Uh, in the case of, of COVID-19. Uh, uh, this is not developed only by public sector. There are public sector bodies involved in this example, but it was led by New York Times. Uh, you can go also on the website of New York Times uh, in the references of the webinar, the PDF, you will find the link to it. Uh, but also in this case, scientists were involved. And in fact, it's a, a healthcare health policy uh, uh, service, but at the same time, it's kind of educational um, uh, service, uh, explaining with um, uh, uh, augmented reality uh, in very physical way, uh, why we need to keep distance, how does it work, what is the 
the impact of wearing a, a mask, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. explaining different ranges and what is happening with the spread of uh, nose drops, for example, if you don't wear masks, even if you wear them, what is happening with it. So um, it's creation of awareness using augmented reality. Uh, and it's a kind of education on the concept of social distancing. Location is, of course, important there. It's 3D it's simulations and visualization. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, I could not test it, but you will be able to test it if you have an iPhone or an iPad. You can download really an application on your iPhone or iPad to, to play around with it. So it's a, a typical example of augmented reality in the context of healthcare. And then the third example uh, is on transport and security, security at airports. Uh, there is an interesting study, and also you will find back the reference to that because there are other examples in that study from Deloitte in 2013 already, uh, focusing more also on augmented reality, but where they compared uh, work processes uh, before without uh, using augmented reality and with using augmented reality what happens for the employees, how is the work more efficient, also more efficient for citizens, for, in this case for travelers, et cetera. And the, the example has been developed uh, on Dulles uh, International Airport in Washington, uh, where uh, security screening was handmade, uh, checking IDs, comparing, doing that manually, checking boarding pass, the names, as we are used to it. Well, not now in these COVID times, but uh, it's a very, very uh, labor intensive uh, process uh, with thousands and thousands of people to be screened, to be checked, making errors also, uh, seeing certain things not and other things yes. Uh, so now with the augmented reality, they compared the process and the officers now have really a new screening program where uh, all passengers get a random uh, uh, passenger number, a unique ID, not necessarily the name, but then uh, they use uh, augmented reality glasses to monitor passenger, uh, uh, passengers, their speed, their behavior. They can check IDs with the number, they can go to the person, the name, but also they can check the contextual uh, uh, surroundings. Uh, so they overlay it. Uh, so they have a vision of, of, of maybe potential threats, uh, warning, giving green light for certain passages, etc. Of course, you can uh, understand that this, in this example, uh, privacy issues, ethics are also uh, important to be treated, but operationally it's possible. And uh, this process for the officers, those uh, uh, passengers that choose for this automatic checking uh, is more efficient, but at the same time, they save a, a lot of time and, and they uh, make also less uh, errors. In the same uh, report of Deloitte, uh, they say, okay, uh, this is a, a huge, of course, it's an older report, because if you look at Gartner hype curve, you will see that uh, especially virtual reality is a little bit over the top, even augmented reality, there is some discussion there, but still the market uh, is still in new figures also estimated very, is a, a huge and potential market. Uh, in 2013, it was around 5 billion uh, estimated, uh, but there is a lot more possible. But uh, also the Lloyd stresses the fact that uh, you need to be prepared to implement such technologies. Uh, it's the readiness question and they put forward five questions uh, to be answered if you want to make the decision to eventually start using it. Uh, who in the organization really requires it? Not It's not a fancy, play uh, playground, uh, it might be a playground, of course, but uh, you need to ask for what it is really uh, required. Where do we really need real time information and, and, and visualizations? Uh, secondly, what are the technology and the data requirements and do we, are we able to cover these, especially the data side, because data is critical without good data and we come back to that, no uh, augmented and virtual reality. What are human resources that are required? Do we have the expertise, the capabilities? Do we need training, guidance, etc.? 
uh, what are also the risks uh, in the previous examples, what are ethics uh, for my organization when we use this, and fifth, what is the impact or what will be the impact the technology might have on our mission critical activities. So that's interesting uh, set of questions to put on the table when a public authority is thinking about uh, the implementation of such uh, technologies. And then we go to three, uh, two case studies, sorry, that's uh, section three, uh, dive a little bit deeper. Uh, first, I will talk you through an example of underground assessment, uh, asset man, assets management. And the second one will uh, be given by my colleague with a lot of dynamics there um, and animation. Uh, so I will go first on the underground uh, assets management. Um, this is based on uh, educational material, and this is also, by the way, available to all of you uh, of a project called AR Infuse, also looking more to augmented reality. The other uh, detailed example would be more on virtual reality. Uh, it, that's a, a project, uh, Erasmus Plus project, uh, with several um, public authorities involved, um, managing underground facilities. But the idea was there to infuse skills uh, on augmented reality for geospatial management in the context of uh, underground assets, infrastructures. Um, so the challenge was or seemed to be in that, in that project and they had some operational settings uh, on which they also developed the training material is that uh, there is a need in this context for uh, good expertise in uh, IT, ICT, but also GNSS, uh, GIS, traditional GIS, geodatabases, visualization techniques. So it's not one type of expertise that is required, but uh, it's multidisciplinary. Um, and uh, one of the challenges was, of course, to convert geospatial data on the underground into a tool that is really then uh, can be treated with augmented reality in, in real field for the field workers and by the field workers in real settings. Uh, so one of the, the website is in the right at the, at the right side in the, on the bottom. Um, you will have a lot of training materials there, a lot of exercises, also tools that you can use. So there is the AR infuse tool, uh, but also several training packages on utility management, on GI and AR, etc. So, from that perspective, it's quite interesting. Um, the what I want to discuss in the context of this webinar is that okay, it might very nice if you see the result, but it's not so not always obvious to reach that result. Uh, there are on the on one hand uh, data challenges, and on the other hand technological challenges. Uh, on the one hand, for the data, uh, data are not always uh, available, at least not publicly available to do this type of exercises. Of course, it should be done by uh, utility managers themselves, maybe. But sometimes there are real security concerns on the data. So that was one of the challenges they dealt with. Secondly, uh, often the data is not at the right precision. Maybe some parameters are not known. One of the critical parameters, of course, the Z factor or this Z attribute. And of course, the challenge in this case is also that the network is by definition underground and you can't see it. So you need to rely on spatial data, spatial plans, whatever to start with and to develop uh, the data uh, environment to be able to develop the uh, augmented reality application. But that's not enough. Uh, you need also to tackle certain technological aspects, uh, working with Cameras can be a camera in a path, in a, a path or in, in, in a smart phone or a real camera. Uh, there are different ways to do that, to do the calibration. It's kind of challenging. You, uh, in this uh, project, they use the vanishing points uh, approach. I will not explain in detail here. Uh, we don't have time to do that, but it's not so obvious as it seems. Uh, secondly, you need also for the camera, you need to have the right pose, the relationship with the real world. And of course, you have, you might have potentially different uh, reference systems that are used for the underground, but also that you apply in the real settings above ground. And so you need uh, with the camera also 
to have tracking features as they call them, uh, to be able to put the right pose and then to make the connection between the camera and the, uh, which captures of course the real world elements and then uh, the underground uh, facility elements. Uh, you can also work with fixed images or real time, but in real time case, you're required to involve GNSS uh, uh, hardware. So that makes things also a little bit more complex. So uh, just to mention that there are a few uh, data and technical challenges. Um, in case of uh, our infuse, they have done uh, pilots and, and applications uh, in Cyprus, in Belgium, in Italy, in the city of Genoa, um, and they have prepared real data. Uh, the data as a starting point is very broad. It can be shapefiles, GML, KML, can be many things, but you need a minimum data feature and attributes for pipelines, for example, not only uh, the Z ground values, which is at the surface level, but also, of course, the depth or the Z values underground, the diameter, for example, to visualize not only as a line, but as a, as a real pipeline, for example. Uh, same for manholes that are uh, mapped and eventually also buildings. Uh, the setting, uh, the, the management of the data can be done in a typical way, but you need still to, to do data preparation processing uh, for AR. It's not just that you can just put AR on top of existing geospatial data. You need uh, good data quality. You need to prepare certain files in certain formats, etc. cetera. Uh, that has been done for, as I said before, for several pilots uh, in, in different countries. Uh, and then what has been done in our infuse is to develop um, uh, also a tool uh, with which they could or can uh, really uh, process the data. So kind of pre-processing in XML uh, formats, uh, then do the calibration of the camera, do the pose estimation. You see that at the right top. Uh, so pose or positioning uh, of uh, several fixed points. On the one hand, uh, the calibration of the camera should be done each time you use the camera. And then you have the 3D visualization, which you see at the left side, uh, where for a street segment, you see at the bottom, um, well, the regular view, and at the top, uh, the added uh, AR view of uh, the underground data. Um, the environments that can be used um, is a real G GI environment, uh, which is in case of RFUs open, based on some open source tools like PostGIS, PostGRES, SQL, uh, Geo tools. Um, but there is also uh, good news if you want, if you use this type of data, there is an installation guideline and also user guidelines are available as part of the project. Um, and with that, I will go out now. There is an example of another company uh, that did a similar exercise and that's operational in Spain where they used augmented reality for BIM and GIS. And now I will go out of the mood. I hope you will be able to see. Okay, I hope you can see my screen in the video. Yes, we can. Okay, uh, here you see uh, the result of work in Spain on a similar exercise, a similar uh, uh, challenge, in fact, where they collected not only information of the uh, uh, underground, but also of some of the devices of the ground uh, above the ground. Uh, for example, here the hydrants, uh, the distance from the hyd hydrants is measured. You see here these holes, the connection to the underground, but they did in this uh, particular exercise, also they collected information on the above ground. So electri electricity poles, electricity lines. They use, as you could see before, uh, kind of iPads to uh, view, to visualize. Uh, in the reality plus uh, the data from the database, but they also use these special eyewares uh, to uh, visualize uh, the data, to uh, ask for some particular data, for example, this manhole, uh, distances again, and other parameters like diameters, etc. Uh, so uh, 
they combined this in this exercise also with BIM. Uh, this is an ongoing effort uh, also in other uh, areas in other countries of the world. Uh, a lot of efforts are done there by extending the model of the underground and utilities with, uh, of course, building information, what's happening in, inside the buildings. Here, the picture is maybe a little bit unclear, but even in uh, situations where there is snow and bad weather, you can still uh, uh, see uh, information on the underground. Um, here, they speak about data collection. Of course, as I said in the other example, uh, the high quality data is very important. And it's clear the more detailed your data set, your database is, that you, the more advanced your augmented reality implementation will be. Uh, the example that you see here is far more extending than in our Infuse uh, because they collected also a lot of information on buildings, on streets, sideways, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And even I think they were starting with collecting information on trees and other uh, objects uh, in the street. So the more uh, complex or the more rich your database is, the more advanced and the more rich your augmented reality. Uh, application will be. Okay, I can stop here. I think we have seen it all. And now I will hand over to Vicente because he will provide uh, the second example. I will stop sharing. Vicente, can you take over from here? Yes, of course. Good afternoon. I'm going to share the, the screen. Um, Okay, can you see the the, the presentation? Yes, we can. So. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, we are going to talk to a, a slightly different presentation. Uh, we are going to talk uh, about the use of virtual reality to know the the past or scenarios that has disappeared. Okay, I work in Gin Geomatics. Uh, we the company was founded in twenty. Five. Uh, we have won in the last year several awards uh, concerning innovation and quality innovation. We have been working in 10 countries in Europe, America, Africa, and Asia. And we have developed dozens of projects in the way of virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, smart cities, even digital twins that uh, this project is almost a digital twin. Okay, we have uh, made this, this project in collaboration with Museo de Altamira, that is a well-established uh, museum in Spain. It was founded in 1924. Uh, it receives about a quarter million visitors per year. And the mission of the museum is to preserve and to manage the Cave of Altamira, the, the art, uh, in it and conserving and making it accessible to the to the public. Okay, for the people uh, who don't know what is Altamira, Altamira is a cave with rock art. It was discovered in 1868. It was the first uh, decorated cave uh, to be discovered, and it's maybe one of the most important caves in in the world with uh, rock art painting. And now the cave is close to public visitors, so the preservation is key. And this is a balanced scenario where any alteration you made, uh, the caves can note it and some uh, bad things can happen. So you have to, to, to keep the balance of the weather, the water, the fungus, all. So any alteration is not good for the cave. So when we start working with Museo de Altamira in 2013, uh, we were called to make a, a 3D model of the cars. So the idea was to create a, a 3D model uh, with all the information of the, of the exterior and the interior of the cave and link some thematic information such as uh, photogrammetry, micro, microphotogrammetry, hyperspectral remote sensing of the panels, etc. Okay, uh, this 
uh, was thought to, to create a new management system. Uh, or maybe uh, the initial digital twin of the cave to, to put all the information available. So we had uh, at the first moment some climate uh, information. We put all the information from the weather stations, from the water monitoring, and we start uh, taking measurement of the biodeterioration uh, monitoring to, to see and to analyze and to understand how the fungus and the bacteria evolve through the time. Uh, with this information, uh, we start thinking about create some other historical scenarios to understand uh, how the decay has arrived to this unsustainable situation. So a part of the present cave that we have, uh, that we already have with the 3D list scanner, uh, we were uh, made to, to create the Paleolithic cave and the Discovery cave. That was the, the cave, how it was when it, it was discovered. So I will show you these two models later, but the purpose was to simulate to simulate some parameters and to understand if the natural light came into the polychrome saline or what happened if a family of Paleolithic uh, people lives in the cave, that sort of things. So once we had these models, uh, we start uh, to make questions to these models. So in, for conservation purposes, it's very important the, the viewpoint because uh, you can alter the paintings and to create a calcite layers that can uh, occlude the, the painting. So the, the, when the water, uh, when we need to know if in the saline uh, there is um, much more water than the, the usual. Okay, so once we can start uh, uh, asking these questions, we have to, uh, to look for the sustainability of the cave. This is a conceptual analysis of sustainability, but uh, the, the approach is, okay, we have a problem, we have a cave that we have to keep uh, as is now. Uh, what we can alter to, or what can I keep to, to find the sustainability. If I let the people come into the cave, they alter the, the balance. Uh, so how many times the cave uh, will last to, to recover the, the initial position? And all this information is key to a uh, correct man, uh, maintenance of the, of the cave and understand the life cycle. So this is what we call uh, Altamira 8D, that is uh, a, a concept derived from the beam and the digital twins. So what uh, we have is to integrate all the information need uh, in, in a model. So as I told you, uh, the first thing uh, that we have, uh, the first, the genesis of the project was Altamira uh, Beer Experience that when the the Altamira film with Antonio Banderas was released in uh, 2016. The, we were say to make the model, as you can see here, of the discovery. This is the cave that the Maria found when she discovered the paintings and now uh, how the cave is. The, the end of this was a multimedia product just to to let the people that didn't know the cave to, to travel the cave uh, and to have the same sensation that Maria when she found the, the, the paintings. Uh, this project was made uh, in Samsung Gear uh, for the release of the film, but uh, for conservation purposes was very useful because we had we already have uh, the model of the cave uh, when it was discovered so in two years later uh, we were set to create the paleolithic cave okay this is the third scenario historical scenario and the idea was to have the the model of the cave uh, 
it was when it was painting and the, the prehistoric people lived there. So I'm going to show you uh, how, how we made it. Okay, we have been talking about data. So we have used uh, uh, dozens and dozens of sources of data. First of all, as I told you, to create the 3D model, uh, GPS, Global Navigation Satellite System and Topographic Total Station, uh, to create the reference system. Uh, secondly, we with this reference system, we integrate the laser scanner to cre uh, create uh, the ortho images polychrome sailing uh, with a resolution of 200 microns. Uh, and water sheds just to understand how the water moves in the in the sailing. Later, we create the, the texture uh, of the exterior of the cave. And nowadays, the, the, the first part of the cave is affected by fungus and bacteria. So we need uh, one similar texture uh, to put in there. But we have to go to two different caves uh, near Altamira. Uh, to to get this this text this texture, so we took uh, 600 pictures to create the texturing of the of the first part of the of the model. Uh, later, uh, we had the the exterior uh, topographic survey just to have the how the exterior was to put all the vegetation. For conservation purposes, in this. AD management system. Later, we have integrated the ground penetration radar model that you can see here. The drone flight to have how it is the, the surface today. And uh, all the, the previous research that from the discovery in 1868 has been made in the cave. So we have some old cartography from the 20s, the 50s, the 70s, the 90s. And some archaeological studies, like the pollen studies, to know where the, the vegetation in the outside, uh, all, the all the excavation remains to see what the bones or what animals they cook or they hunt, and some uh, weather historical series, and and finally uh, to to discover the art. So we when we take a picture. Uh, we can we we have the picture of the art, but with hyperspectral and multispectral remote sensing, we can uh, guess uh, what is below one picture or even two layers of pictures. So if one pigment is inside, so to make this uh, roll color study, we have integrated uh, remote sensing, uh, hyperspectral and multispectral remote sensing. So I'm going to. So what we quickly discuss some pictures uh, with the GPS, taking the reference system. This is in the GPR campaign, laser scanning. So the whole cave was, was recorded in a 3D model. We took, these are the textures of the, the high resolution texture of two caves, the Cudon, Cueva de Cudon and El Pendo Cave that we use to texture. And finally, this is the standard topographic uh, survey we made in 2013 that is uh, previous to the drone flight we have now, but is the one we use for, for the cave. Okay, once we have all this data, uh, uh, we put all the scan position all together and we georeference all the data. The, the end was to create a full 3D model of the cave. You can see here where it rotating and maybe you can see it with virtual reality helmets. And, but it's just the, the raw data to create uh, things. Okay, with this, this uh, point cloud data, uh, what created was the 3D model of the cave. Uh, initially, we had for conservation uh, eight parts of our 4 million polygons, but for the virtual reality, we re reduced that to almost 1 million polygons. Okay, once we have the 3D model of the current state that is the left, uh, we start uh, including all the excavation, all the historic excavation data to create the, the model of the Paleolithic of the Paleolithic moment. 
uh, we have to create a, a living area in the exterior and we have to 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 change because the polychrome ceiling was open to the exterior and the floor uh, you can see is different uh, this is the current that it has been excavated and this is the original or the paleolithic uh, floor these are artificial walls that has been uh, built the, during the 50s and has altered the the cake okay when we have the the model we had to divide it in in 16 parts uh, just to, to create good texture for each part of, of them. And you can see here the transition between the current model uh, with the mesh we use for the virtual reality and uh, how the Paleolithic model was. The, the saving is the same, but all the floors has been uh, corrected to the to the to the excavations they made in the polychrome hall. Okay, just to create the virtual reality model, we have to create the UVs model and the texture. And after uh, to to correct the shades and to insert the, the the lights. And here is the transition between the model and the the first model and the texture model. Okay, when we have the model of the whole cave, uh, we have to, to see the, the model of the sailing of polychrome. We use a, a model with uh, 2,300 pictures. Uh, the model we have for conservation with 200 microns. And we reduce the 3D model to half a million points uh, model just to, to, to have a very realistic model. Later, uh, we have to recreate the living area and the, the passage and all the all the things they had. And, and we create some 3D models of fauna bones, antlers, uh, patels, uh, marrow lamps, chestnuts, uh, cone shells, teeth, skins, just to to have all the things uh, the, 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 the painter need to, here you can see the, the patels and the shells uh, that uh, need the, the artist to, to paint the, the sailing. Okay, finally, uh, we were made to, to create six people and one child. Uh, these people was created from zero from the information the museum had the clothes and how the 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 design of the clothes was similar to to the maniquee they had in the museum and we had to animate the the elements and to see the the to ambient to to have the the artist painting the the sailing and finally, the, the exterior, the recreation of the, of the exterior of the natural environment. So we had a, some information from the pollen analysis. So we had that to use that uh, trees. And so the, basically the, the vegetation consisting of birch, uh, hazel, dogwood, hen oak, juniper, ash, elm, pine, uh, linden trees, oaks, so with that species, the, the pollen studies uh, through, uh, we create all, all the exterior. And one thing that is very important uh, for us is the lighting. So it's very important uh, for the perception of the color to have a, a correct uh, color temperature and the, the dimming adjust. Okay, so we had to simulate the, the marrow lamps the people who paint the cave had so we calibrate the lights to to have the same color temperature than the the marrow lamps that is the one you see in the middle and finally uh, instead of half a dynamic light we create an ambient light to to have the scenario uh, lighted just to create a good experience in the people uh, who, who was the, the model. Later in this case, as it was going to be 
displayed in a, in a temporal exposition, we create a video uh, that uh, move from the exterior and explain all the all the model with all the credits and and all the things. So finally, uh, okay, you can see the the result. Uh, the result is in three languages: is in Spanish, in English, in France, in French. And it's available in the in the web of the museum. Uh, the most important thing is that we have used uh, more than twenty sources of data with databases, 3D information, weather information, but the impact in the case has been zero because we have taken advantage of the data we use in conservation to, to create this touristic and, and educational product. So just to have an idea of the impact, the premiere of this video it was in the temporary exposition, the art of reproducing art in December, 2018. Uh, there were almost a uh, hundred thousand visitors and they made last year available uh, the internet and about 75,000 people has has seen the any of the of the videos okay so I, with this i finish my my part and i give uh, danny the the Work. Thank you, thank you, Vicente. Very interesting case uh, on virtual reality. Um, we all would be very keen to be able to visit the cave uh, for the time being, that might be not uh, possible. Uh, I think there is a poll now, Simon. Yes, indeed. So let's talk about the barriers a bit. Uh, so according to you, what were the most significant barrier for implementing an immersive visualization technique? Would it be lack of high quality 3D, 3D data? Time consuming work to bring together, prepare and manage the data? Need for investing in relatively expensive hardware, for example, AWAR that was mentioned before. Uh, immersive realities are still seen as a nice to have, but not a necessity. So the benefits are not clear and a lack of expertise and skills for implementing these techniques. So please, so what do you think? Would really interesting in your opinion. By the way, we sent a very, very impressive case you presented. <clears throat> so maybe another five seconds and then we'll stop the polling. Okay, let's stop it and share the results. A lack of expertise and skill for implementing these techniques. So I think it's uh, still space for webinars, Danny. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, we will finish uh, very soon, but still, we want to share with you a few ideas on uh, in all of this. Uh, what are interoperability efforts? What's ongoing from on that side, on that level, and what are uh, potential challenges that are being discussed in the standardization community? Uh, very briefly, because we are not uh, able and not willing in this context of the context of this webinar to go in detail, but there's a lot of things ongoing in the standardization world on particular issues. Some are working more on augmented reality, others on virtual reality, some organizations on, on both. Um, in even also in the traditional uh, standardization organizations such as ISO, Etsy, IEEE, there are a lot of efforts, there are standards. For example, IEEE has the P2048 series of standards, which seems to be very interesting when you want to implement such uh, environments and to do it in a standardized way. There is also this joint technical committee of ISO and IEC, uh, which is, a, there is a specific subcommittee 24 on computer graphics and image processing, where there's a lot of relevant standardization ongoing. Um, uh, and then, of course, you have, uh, on the one hand, uh, the Open Geospatial Consortium, which uh, together with W3C, but also in their own working group, their own SWICs, are doing specific uh, work that is relevant for uh, uh, work related to virtual reality, augmented reality, etc. Uh, there are two SWICs that are relevant, which is Geopose, which is more uh, working or focusing on this positioning problem uh, of cameras, etc. 
and then there is the MUDI, nothing to do with MUD, but the uh, uh, standardization working group, which is more working on the underground data definition and integration uh, model. Um, in general, OGC is uh, following uh, immersive visualization in the context of future directions. I have a separate slide on that. And there is, of course, collaboration with ISO, with the other standardization bodies, but also with some external consortia or associations that are working also on standards like the Kronos Group, the OpenAR, Augmented Reality Cloud Association, Web3D Consortium, etc. So there is a lot of things ongoing and there is also very recent work in all these standardization bodies. So some of it is a little bit older, but there's also uh, a lot of new initiatives and uh, new standardization initiatives. If we quickly look at OGC, uh, then there is a lot of things ongoing uh, in the ge so-called geospatial tech trends. Uh, work of uh, OGC, where immersive uh, visualization is one of the topics that they follow closely, but they say immediately it's very closely linked to other topics uh, that they are following and that they are elaborating standards for. Um, so they have one uh, technical tre uh, uh, trends, which is this immersive geo, that's the uh, cluster. Uh, but there you have immersive visualization uh, that they have a specific topic to focus on, but also uh, other topics uh, are being followed in different groups. Um, LiDAR scanning, edge computing is relevant to store information. Uh, 5G, uh, of course, for urban areas, indoor models and indoor positioning. As we have seen also underground uh, aspects, uh, there is a link to simulation and gaming, etc. So. Uh, there is a lot of work ongoing in different areas and these things are coming together in the so-called clusters. The immersive geo cluster for um, OGC is working. The techn technical readiness level is taken from the uh, methodology in the framework from NASA uh, is at the highest level. Uh, so. The, it means that for OGC, the maturity of the technology is good enough, very high, so high enough, but the interoperability readiness is still at a relatively low area or low level, uh, which is, by the way, also a readiness uh, level mechanism that is uh, borrowed from NASA or done together with NASA. Uh, to uh, bring that further, uh, OGC is doing different studies, pilot testing, uh, and one of the ongoing studies is the OGC mixed reality to the edge uh, concept development study. Um, and I think these type of studies will be open as everything is open uh, of what uh, OGC is producing. Uh, one of the discussions uh, within OGC, but also with other associations, uh, including um, uh, Web XR, XR um, uh, developments, is the interoperability challenge uh, more on the uh, discoverability side uh, is, okay, there is a lot of augmented reality, virtual reality resources out there, specific data, uh, uh, very visual data, but how can we know what is existing where? A uh, typical example that we also have in the context of spatial data infrastructures. And there they are working on a solution with big players, mainly from the private sector, uh, to develop the so called content pumps, uh, where uh, there is different mechanisms to uh, uh, improve and facilitate uh, discoverability. Um, going from speech search uh, to automatic continuous context-based uh, querying, uh, but also uh, the development of specific applications to uh, find augmented reality implementations. And in that context, there is a discussion ongoing that uh, the standardization bodies should uh, more closely work together, because if that work is not standardized, the risk is that we will end up again with uh, technological silos depending on the uh, solution provider. Uh, a lot of, this, of things are ongoing there. WebXR uh, uh, is there uh, a good reference, an important uh, ongoing work that is meant to build 3D augmented reality and virtual reality experience using combination of HTML and JavaScript searching 
mechanisms, but also in OGC context, there is uh, several activities ongoing. And also emerging technology will uh, support that. Uh, just to mention that there is new challenges on the interoperability side, on the standardization side that are not entirely solved, but that are, uh, that are ongoing efforts. And I want to end this seminar before giving you the floor and maybe we do first the poll. Uh, I will end up uh, just after that with some uh, conclusions and uh, key messages. Yes, indeed. I hope you, there is a new poll on the screen. So asking you, does your organization plan to use immersive visualization techniques in the let's say, near future? I hope that uh, the webinar and the topic uh, itself uh, inspired you a bit. Okay, let's take another five seconds. And and the polling, sharing the results. So uh, more or less, yes. So your, some departments are planning to test the techniques or tests are currently occurring, but no operational implementation yet. So good, good outlooks. Yeah, that uh, would be interesting to know more about it, what is happening or coming out from these tests and on which time frame you are thinking. I come to some of conclusions uh, on the one hand and then some a uh, few messages. So for me, some concluding remarks is that these immersive visualization techniques, they exist maybe for some time, uh, but it's quite variable. So uh, virtual reality is not the same as augmented reality and there is with new developments, also new possibilities. And especially these mixed realities seem to be very uh, promising, although we did not have real operational examples on that yet. Um, we think also that it can be fully uh, exploited only when we have the right hardware, but also, um, also the soft parts. Um, the, the good thing is, well, some uh, needs investments and are maybe more expensive, but you can also do first tests and first work with relatively uh, cheap choices or cheap devices such as smartphones uh, and pads, for example. Uh, it's also clear that it's not something only for the entertainment industry and for academia, etc., but also public authorities, governments can really use it and use it in the context of public services, location-based public, public services towards citizens. So there are many uh, potential applications there. So that's clear also from some of the examples. Uh, some challenges and priorities, uh, it's clear if you want to do VR, AR, or whatever R, uh, you need really high quality base data. It should be, it is a must to have it 3D. Uh, you need the right attributes uh, to connect it to real world experiences. Uh, and of course, in most cases, we need the geospatial uh, components. It's also a little bit challenging. It was one of the polls showed that uh, knowledge, skills, expertise, maybe not there. Uh, but also one of the findings on the different examples is, is that such technologies can be implemented by only geospatial people or just ICT people. You need to collaborate, you need to bring together uh, expertise from different fields, including computer vision, uh, but also our expertise, more location data and technologies. And then finally, it's not that it's just pushing on a button or having buying a software and just do it. Um, it needs a little bit more because there are still uh, uh, well challenges related to the data, but also the aspect of discoverability. How can you implement and use it then uh, um, towards your public? Uh, and how can you make it found and discovered? And with that, I want to uh, end uh, our part and maybe we can keep a few more minutes to have questions from your side. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Danny. Thank you very much, Vicente. So uh, it's time, we are a bit running a bit late, but uh, still let's uh, have some time if there are any questions from the uh, from the public at the moment. I will check the chat, uh, there is nothing specific. Uh, maybe, maybe if I can uh, uh, mention or ask Vicente uh, one question. 
Uh, you mentioned uh, the data integration, and if I recall correctly, there were you mentioned 20 different data sources, and uh, also the lifespan of those data sources was quite impressive. Uh, I think uh, from the digital to from analog to digital, so over 100 years. So, could you highlight maybe some of the challenges you had in the data integration? Uh, yes. Um... Okay, um, we have the, the advantage that the Cape of Altamira was discovered in 1968, and they have been working uh, almost from the beginning in research. So we have uh, not only uh, topographic and 3D data, because we have the 3D laser scanner, the, the GPS, the ground penetration radar, the drone, or, you know, all that information, that we have a lot of information about weather, about uh, all the excavations, you know, that some uh, art, uh, they have found some art, we have the position, we can recover the position. They have a lot of the, the, the pollen studies, uh, you know, the, the datations of the picture. So uh, from the, maybe from the twenties, uh, a lot of researchers has been work, have been working in the in the cave. So this is we have created the container to implement of, of that data, uh, not only uh, from that moment, uh, but also uh, dynamic data. You know the weather, the weather in the 80s, in the 90s, in the now, because they have been different. So there are many sources of data that if you have the the right model, you can integrate. So this is a big database uh, and a lot of 3D elements. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vicente, for this, uh, for breaking the ice. I think there is a question. Uh, Ula, please, you have a question. I do, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Danny, for walking us uh, through this <laughs> very interesting uh, subject and Vincente for a real uh, impressive use case. My, my question uh, goes as... Um, as this, as a public data provider and data collector, what can we do in order to prepare our data to be more ready for, for VR or, or AR? Mm. That's, that's a good question because I was also, uh, I don't know if you hear me. Uh, I do. You, yeah, ah, okay, yeah. I, 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 I thought I was muted. Okay, uh, no, it's an interesting question because I was wondering myself, um, what I understood from the case on the underground is that they had quiet in their project. It was not uh, an operational project, it was rather an educational project, but based on real cases, case-based learning uh, on real cases in Cyprus, Belgium, et cetera, where they started from existing data. And what I understood is that they still had a lot of processing, pre-processing, uh, things to be done, uh, missing attributes, maybe uh, partially missing only for, in some cases, in other cases, uh, entirely missing. So um, I, I think in, if we speak about augmented reality, virtual reality, the other realities, the key factor is, are we uh, with our spatial data infrastructure 3D already operational in, in that way that we have all uh, the attributes, all the, the layers of our typical GI environment. Do we have this in an operational manner? Is it also used? Uh, do we have this connection already to, to BIM and, uh, well, the uh, CT 3D uh, uh, model? Um, do we have that? I think if you don't have that at all in, in public sectors, because there is big difference. I know they have a lot in Germany, they have a lot in the Netherlands. I know they're working on it in Belgium, but it's not yet full, fully available. As long as you don't have this 3D, uh, there are limitations or you can only apply it on one city where you have it or whatever. Uh, so that's for me a condition. And then I think there is also a need to do some specific quality uh, assurance uh, on existing data sets whether they are fit to be used for or to be, yeah, to be integrating such imp implementations. And that's what I understand. And that would be interesting. Uh, there is some material available from our Infuse for the underground thing. Um, so some guidance and some, that is necessary, I think, for public sector bodies that they can easily say, okay, uh, this is the guidance. This is the workflow I have to follow to pre-process my, 
data I have to really make it uh, readily available. And what I understood from the Helsinki case is that if you create your, from your geospatial data infrastructure already uh, really a digital twin, then it's more easy to start from that to deliver augmented reality or virtual reality applications. So in general terms, but of course that's maybe uh, future thinking and ideas because not every, not even every city has that, but uh, is to go from uh, SDIs rather towards digital twin environments, which can not only be for urban areas, but can also be for rural areas, but we are not yet there, of course. Um, so in the future, I think if we go in that direction, it will be easier to integrate augmented reality and virtual reality. Thank you, Danny, for answering this tool. I think there is another question from Elisa team, from Lorena to Vicente. Lorena, please. Yes, thank you. I hope you can uh, hear me properly. Yes, my question is, um, I mean, first of all, um, even if I'm part of the um, Elise webinar preparation team, I keep on being really impressed about all, uh, all this field. I think it's just um, immense and uh, I'm really keen to, to continue learning on this. So maybe on, on Vicente's case, on the Altamira case, I wanted to know if um, currently you are making use of live data, maybe uh, for uh, crowd control, for uh, controlling how many visitors could uh, be entering da daily because of the sustainability issues that the cave has to um, uh, has to face. And um, if not, if you if you're planning to, to do so. Thank you. These are the following steps. We have now the model in the in the 5D, 6D, and now um, what we are doing now is to work in in the direction of the sustainability of the cave and to make it because uh, now the the weather is changing. You know the climate change has uh, has been affecting, and all the data, all the historic data we have of the of the cave uh, doesn't fit. To the to the current models, so we need to start and and to integrate new data and to understand the how what happens when something is changed in the in the cave. So the visitors, we have only the graph, but not the simulation of how the weather changes and all the currents of the of the air. And the, if we alter the view, we have this experience in other caves in Cantabria, but not in Altamira. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Vincente, for our answer and Lorena to, for a question. Uh, Fred, uh, would you like to comment? You shared the link. Sorry, I didn't have time to 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 take a look. Would you like to some to comment something on that? Fred Hege. Yes, no, no I have unmuted. Yes, sorry. I just uh, introduced uh, the URL of the complete Netherlands 3D. Uh, uh, it's called 3D Bach. So it was for information for you. It, it just okay, really... thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, oh, yes, you are ready. You, you are ready. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I don't see any further question in the, in the chat box. So I would just, uh, before we end, uh, share with you a few further information and invite you uh, for some events that uh, it will be held next week. So uh, there is a digital public conference, uh, joint event of ISA Square and CEP uh, um, uh, actions uh, that is uh, being organized on 20th, 21st and 22nd of April. And I would like to remind you that on, the, on Thursday, 22nd April, between 12.30 and two o'clock in the afternoon, there is a ELISA workshop uh, with the title Elisa enabling the interoperability of digital government from a location perspective. So you are really kindly welcome to, to, to join, to register for the event and for our workshop, uh, maybe to find out more how Elisa has uh, contributed to the uh, interoperability in general. Maybe also to remind you to some other further Elisa webinars that will be held later on in May and June. As you can see on the next slide, so in the beginning, uh, Danny, please, can you move the next slide? Oh, sorry. Yeah. In the beginning, in the beginning of May, we are planning uh, three 
another ELISA webinar giving an overview on ELISA outputs by the objective areas that were mentioned at the beginning. So that means uh, policy support, uh, interoperable cross-border and cross-sector frameworks and solutions and uh, emerging technologies and trends. So that are planned for 4th, 5th and 6th of May. Uh, further in May, in June, we are uh, uh, planning also two other webinars on the energy efficiency and location and the webinar on the registry and reference validator. Uh, so before to close down, uh, just to share with you some, so thank you, first of all, for all attending and for all the speakers and for all the nice, uh, let's say, use cases and case studies presented today, uh, as well for your questions. And uh, just for the end, as you can see on the slides, uh, we are inviting you and, uh, and that has been also uh, communicated uh, with you through the, um, through the chat box, uh, some links, uh, so you can follow us on the uh, next one, please, Danny. Okay. Follow us on the, to join us, the Elisa community on the join up, uh, follow us on Twitter or on the video channel where also all the webinars are stored. So thank you once again for today and see you at the next webinar.